You're listening to TIP. On today's show, I have Ian Formigli from CrowdStreet join me to talk about all things related to commercial real estate and how to invest in real estate using crowdfunding. Ian is currently an active real estate investor himself, as well as the chief investment officer at CrowdStreet. If you've been enjoying the free episodes of this podcast, be sure to follow me on Instagram to get a ton more free content. I post on Instagram almost every single day with educational content about investing in real estate, the stock market, personal finance, and all kinds of topics related to business. You can follow me on Instagram at my username, Robert at TIP, and that's spelled out as Robert at TIP. Now let's jump into this episode of the Real Estate Investing Podcast. You're listening to Real Estate Investing by the Investors Podcast Network, where your host, Robert Leonard, interviews successful investors from various real estate investing niches to help educate you on your real estate investing journey. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Robert Leonard. And with me today, I have Ian Formigli from CrowdStreet. Welcome to the show, Ian. Thanks, Robert. It's a pleasure to be here. And you know, as you know, I'm a super big fan of the TIP podcast. So to do this with you, it's super flattering. So I'm excited to join today. Some of the listeners may be familiar with you from being on We Study Billionaires with Preston and Stig. But just for those who aren't, walk us through your background and where you're at today. Sure, I'd be happy to. So I am the Chief Investment Officer at CrowdStreet, and CrowdStreet is a leading online commercial real estate investment platform. We're based in Portland, Oregon, and I joined CrowdStreet in the summer of 2014 to oversee our marketplace. By volume, CrowdStreet is, to our knowledge, the largest online commercial real estate investment marketplace in the world. We've done over $13 billion worth of deals on our platform, but also I definitely would fair, it's fair to say that this is a nascent industry. and. So prior to joining CrowdStreet, my background is in commercial real estate, private equity, and derivatives trading. I was previously a senior acquisitions officer for a group based here in Portland, Oregon. And I would say that under the tutelage of my former mentors, this is really where I learned how to understand commercial real estate, how it functions, how to identify opportunity, and as well as risk. And before that, I spent the first part of my career as an equity options market maker. I traded in an open outcry pit in San Francisco. So I'm one of those old traders that used to wear a jacket and stand in a crowd. And that's where I first learned about capital markets and really how to evaluate risk in a a rapidly changing, fast-paced environment. I'd say that the majority of the people listening to the show today are either new investors or at least individual personal investors, as in they invest in real estate directly themselves, maybe not so much through crowdfunding. So for those who may not know, what exactly is CrowdStreet and what is real estate crowdfunding? Yeah, no, happy to discuss that. CrowdStreet is an award-winning online commercial real estate investment marketplace. That's when you show up to the website and you see us, that's what we really are. And what that means is that we give accredited investors access to institutional quality, commercial real estate, private equity offerings. Really what we're doing is we're building a community where individuals and commercial real estate firms come together to invest in commercial real estate. And so CrowdStreet as a platform was really born out of the Jumpstart Our Business Startups or Jobs Act of 2012. Title II of this act, which was passed in September of 2013, and for any listeners who've listened to one of my previous episodes have heard, you know, this is what authorized general solicitation or advertising of Regulation D private offerings. And commercial real estate investment is largely comprised of these types of offerings. So now that we could put an advertisement or a general solicitation around a private deal, we could talk about it nationally. If we could talk about it nationally, we could put it on a website. So this act is really what set the stage for our platform and even at the macro level, what is now commonly referred to as real estate crowdfunding. But what I would say about real estate crowdfunding is that at its core, this is really just real estate syndication. We're simply taking it and we're changing its modality. So at CrowdStreet, when you invest in a single asset, you're investing directly with that sponsor. And this is what we call the direct to investor model. So you're participating in a syndication, you're just doing it online versus offline, how it's been done for literally hundreds of years. By leveraging legislation and then applying technology to it, 
We've taken this old offline syndication model and we've brought scale and transparency to it. So I'd say that prior to the existence of a technology platform like CrowdStreet, there's no real estate operator that I could imagine. I used to be one of those. And I would say that I would never even contemplate the possibility of 400 individual investors in a deal with an average investment amount of less than 50,000. It just was simply unheard of up until a few years ago. And so what's changed is that now we have seen that exact kind of scale occur multiple times on our marketplace. And so now that this scaling is, is happening, it's really truly beginning to disrupt how commercial real estate is capitalized. I think it's just a fascinating time in our industry. Why would somebody as a real estate investor decide to invest in real estate through a crowdfunding platform rather than just investing in the deals directly themselves? Yeah, it's a good question. It's totally a fair question. And I'd say that I think that there's a lot of benefits to utilizing crowdfunding platforms in general to invest in commercial real estate. I'll go through, I think, is the top five. And I think in the order of which I hear them from actual investors on our marketplace. The number one is access. This is the thing I hear every day. Investors come to our platform and they tell us how amazing it is for them to see great deal flow from real estate operators all over the country, most of whom they would never have been able to get to know or see their deal were it not for our marketplace. And I hear this same phenomenon, the same perspective from operators as well. So prior to online platforms, commercial real estate investing for individuals was really largely a local game. If you think about it, you're, you're maybe living in your part in your city. And if you're lucky, you got introduced to somebody from a friend or a colleague and that group is probably based in your metro, and they're probably doing a deal somewhere in your state. And that's kind of how syndication used to occur. So what our marketplace has done now is that we have investors from Orlando investing with groups based in Seattle and vice versa. So for investors, an online platform brings an entire nation of real estate operators and real estate investment opportunities literally to your fingertips, in your own home, at your own time. Number two, I think is vetting. And so prior to launching on our marketplace, every deal that you see on our platform must pass a multi-step vetting process that includes us reviewing the sponsor, the deal, and the terms of that deal. CrowdStreet has a team of employees, for example, that are situated all around the country. They're constantly hunting deal flow. And although I can't say that I recommend or give investment advice to anybody in general out there, what I can say is that we do have a thorough vetting process. And by that, what I mean is that roughly about 5% of everything that we see out in the field is what actually makes it onto the marketplace. And I'll be the first to admit that we're far from perfect, but investors do gain the benefit of knowing that through our investments process, we pass on 95 deals to bring them five. And investors can read a full overview of our vetting process and watch videos that discuss it in more detail on our website. So happy to, you know, feel free to check it out. The third thing I would say is education. And this is the part that's fun. I enjoy it. And I think I hear it from investors every day. And, and I appreciate when I'm at an investor event and people come up and talk to me about how we're giving them great education and great tools that they utilize every day. And it's allowing them to jump up the learning curve and become better informed investors. And that's part of like why we set out to do this is let's increase sophistication of everybody together. So I would say that our catalog of written content is vast, but it's really when you pair it with our webinars that we hold on a constant basis that really makes for a powerful combo. The fourth thing I would say is consolidation. Currently, about 67% of active CrowdStreet investors have invested multiple times on our platform, and the number of repeat investments among those investors can reach actually over 80 deals for a couple of investors. So once we see that investors amass maybe at least five or more investments, then we've definitely noticed that they gain a lot of value from consolidating the reporting and the analysis of their active investments through our platform, through what we call our investor rooms. And I think this is what I probably call something kind of like the Amazon effect. Once you know where you want to shop for something online, being able to shop for it all in one place with an interface that allows you to easily track it and management as you go forward is pretty powerful. And then I think the final thing, the fifth and final thing is the ongoing involvement. And what I mean by that is that 
as offerings appear in our marketplace, well, that's not when we stop the involvement. CrowdStreet stays involved throughout the entire holding period of that investment. That might be two years, it might be 10 years. In many instances, through our investment vehicles, we are also co-investors right alongside the marketplace participants. So, you know, we have a growing team of professionals at CrowdStreet that monitor investments and they communicate with investors. Sometimes this might translate into us hosting webinars around special events like a voting decision. Maybe we have to decide if we're going to sell a property or recapitalize it. And it's in instances like these where we provide the investors with valuable information in an easy to understand format. What I like to think of here is that we're the professionals, we always get it, and we understand what the sponsor is trying to convey. And so what we'll do is we'll break it down. And it's in those instances where I've seen that these investors not only find a lot of value in it, they've actually literally come to like rely on our perspective as these deals unfold. So those are the top five things, but I think it even goes from there, but we see those day in, day out. So I think you mentioned a few points there that could probably answer this next question as well, but what differentiates a platform like CrowdStreet from another platform like maybe Fundrise or Realty Shares or something along those lines? What makes CrowdStreet different? Yeah. So I think that, well, first of all, I agree with you, Robert, that there's different types of platforms. They have focused on different aspects within this industry. And in 2020, I would say that the leaders that are at the top, I think there's kind of, you know, we're now down to three or four. We have more or less started to specialize in various elements, aspects of this industry. When I think about CrowdStreet and what we do and how it's different than some of the other platforms, what stands out to me, what I think is differentiated about us is two things. One, we have a true two-sided real estate marketplace. A lot of platforms, there's very quality platforms, but they really have what we would say is maybe like an investment vehicle type marketplace. You show up, you invest in a certain product, that is what you have options to. You're investing with the platform. The underlying real estate is something that the investment vehicles go to. CrowdStreet blends into that, but you have the option to invest directly into a deal with that operator and be a limited partner directly in the deal. So one, True two-sided marketplace, I think, is one thing that stands out. Say the other thing that really I feel is different today is, one, when we think about the total volume of, the, of those transactions, I don't think there's another platform in this country that can cite over $13 billion worth of deal flow. We've had over 400 investments go live on the marketplace at this point. And by getting to that, that high volume, what we're really talking about is larger deals. We have focused from the inception on what we call institutional quality commercial real estate. And that's, I think, a little bit different than some of the other platforms have done. You know, the average deal size on CrowdStreet's, you know, about $40 million. And it's usually backed by a group that has today, on average, a portfolio of about a billion dollars. And so I think that's just a differentiator. So we've really focused on a different aspect of the, the commercial real estate, you know, crowdfunding space. And I think those two things are really what I think stands out and makes us different. And I think then the third is a little bit of a sub point there is that it's through that velocity of that marketplace that has powered our ability to bring, I think, what are some interesting and unique index style products. We have something called the CrowdStreet Blended Portfolio. And the reason that we could actually bring the blended portfolio to market is that once we were doing over 100 deals a year that was translating into billions of dollars of real estate per year, we created an algorithm that then allocates money that we'll raise in a blind pool format, but then it seamlessly and rapidly deploys that money over now a period of six to eight months into about 30 deals. And you need billions of dollars worth of real estate to be able to to make that kind of a product work. So it's really going back to the core of when you have a large and viable two-sided marketplace, that you are then able to actually build some vehicles that leverage that and then you know, create some interesting investment opportunities. Throughout this conversation so far, you've mentioned that CrowdStreet's really focused on your commercial type properties. So depending on who you're speaking with, there tends to be a little bit of variation in the definitions of what an actual commercial property is. Some say anything over four units is a commercial property because that's how banks generally look at them, while others only consider properties leased to businesses for business purposes is a commercial property like strip malls or maybe office space. How do you and CrowdStreet define commercial real estate? Yeah, sure. I do agree with you that this definition of commercial real estate really does vary widely depending upon who you ask. And that's why just a minute ago, I brought up the term institutional quality commercial real estate, since that's what we do seek for our marketplace. And generally speaking, CrowdStreet's going to define institutional quality 
as well-maintained properties that are typically being sold by a company in the business of owning and operating commercial real estate to another company that is in the business of owning and operating commercial real estate. And to put a number on this definition, we're going to see the property values on our marketplace begin at about $10 million. And I'd say particularly on the small side, if you think about asset classes such as industrial or storage, they tend to be a little bit cheaper than office or retail and so forth. Uh, and they've gone as high as $250 million. And that same number that I mentioned a minute ago, about an average of $40 million. Well, in a secondary market, a $40 million asset is typically going to be what we call institutional quality. Why did CrowdStreet decide to build a platform focused specifically on these properties? Was it to differentiate themselves from the other platforms or is there a different reason? It's a great question. And I would say that this takes me right back to the philosophical types of conversations that I had with the two co-founders of the company prior to me joining in the summer of 2014. And I'd say even this focus has maybe a little bit to do with me personally, because this, this was right along the lines of my own philosophy. And this is where I think when I talked about with the co-founders about the vision for what we should go do, uh, you know, there's a lot of reasons behind why we focused on them, but I'd say these, you know, kind of the following is in terms of what I see as the major ones. So the first thing was that by going after commercial real estate in an institutional quality section of it, I think, first of all, you get more reliable and consistent information about those deals. So when we think about making an informed investment decision to buy a property, it's going to require the review and analysis of a tremendous amount of information. And I was bringing, I think, empathy for this because I was an acquisitions officer and I was trying to go out and acquire commercial real estate for the years prior to joining CrowdStreet. And I knew how much it takes and what you need to get to in terms of an informed opinion, knowing what you're going to get before you actually feel comfortable closing on an asset. Now, to get to this information, you know, some of it you can acquire independently of a seller through your own due diligence. You can walk properties and you can ask people, you can meet with brokers and so forth. You can also hire third party groups to go in and analyze assets, you know, on your behalf. We call that third party reports. They inspect the physical quality, maybe the environmental aspects of it. You know, but for a lot of the information, for you to really get to it, you do need the seller to provide it. And by operating in the world of institutional quality commercial real estate, there's simply a lot more information that's available on the property. And the key thing is that for the most part, you can trust it. At the institutional level, commercial real estate is a pretty small world. And even today, the top brokerage firms, such as a CBRE or Cushman and Wakefield, they're still the gatekeepers on a lot of these transactions. And so there, what I would say is that there's really one degree of separation across this whole industry, you know, when we get to the upper tiers. And so while things like a purchase and sale agreement will require a seller to represent that the information they provide is accurate, I think the biggest risk to an institutional seller of providing bad information is not really within the contract, but it's within the damage that it causes to their reputation in the industry. I mean, I see this every day. These groups have trusted relationships amongst brokerage firms and everybody knows who they are and you know who they are and they know who you are. It's just how it goes. So I think it's this need for institutional groups to maintain a good industry reputation that really makes the top players respect the rules. When you go below institutional level and in commercial real estate and get into maybe sub-levels of, of real estate, I think you run into a lot of issues. You know, first, there's simply a lot of information that's missing you know, non-pros just don't know what they don't know. They're not necessarily deceitful operators. They're just, they just don't know what they don't know. Second, I'd say that even if a non-professional seller is not trying to defraud you, there's still just a real possibility they're so bad at tracking the data that, they're, what, that the data they're providing you with can be full of errors to the point that sometimes it's worthless. And so I think this is why most representation clauses within contracts they're caveated with the statement to the best of seller's knowledge. And I think that really sells it all. And I think that really says it all because if the seller knows nothing, you can't hold them accountable for being ignorant. So moving on, thinking about other things, you know, I would say also second, there's more confidence in the operators, generally speaking. Due to what I would say our, is our direct to investor model, CrowdStreet's got to have confidence that the operators that we bring to our marketplace are and will continue to be good stewards of investor capital over the holding period. Institutional quality commercial real estate 
is most frequently acquired by established companies with strong track records and teams of professionals that are in place to handle all the various required elements that are necessary to execute a business plan, such as strong investor reporting, asset management, accounting, and investor relations. So these are the things that we really think. When I think about bringing a deal to the marketplace, I have to have confidence that the operator can execute at that level. And by going to the institutional level, you know that nine times out of 10, you're getting that level of execution in an operator. I think the third thing, kind of almost piggybacking on the second thing, is that you get better repeatability of sponsors. So from a sponsor perspective, CrowdStreet and I think every CrowdStreet investor is really ultimately seeking long-term sustainable relationships where we can count on the sponsor, not only to deliver a high degree of professionalism to the investors, but to continue to bring a series of viable investments to the marketplace over a period of multiple years. This type of consistency is better for both investors and sponsors. It's better for us as a platform too. And by sticking with institutional quality commercial real estate, you've got a much better chance of working into this kind of a groove since it's the largest groups that often have the best, largest, and most sustainable pipelines of deal flow. You can always find a winner sometimes with a smaller group. It's just a lot harder to find a series of winners. And I think the fourth thing to think about is that we look for better consistency of returns. I think we can find them more likely by focusing on this type of real estate. So kind of going back to the, to the notion of professionals, right? Professionals, no matter what the industry, they're typically pretty good at what they do. And by investing in institutional quality commercial real estate, well, you're playing in the majors, so to speak, you know, which as an investor means that you're gaining access to the highest caliber of operators. This can translate into a higher probability of quality execution, as well as more sophisticated underwriting assumptions. Better underwriting assumptions are going to lead to a higher probability of meeting or exceeding pro forma returns. Groups are always going to get some of them wrong, but you're looking for the batting average over the long term. And so, I mean, and so for example, just case in point, this is why pensions and endowments, they place so much emphasis on the operator. They place a lot less emphasis on the deal. It's literally they're going to allocate money to the operator and then let the operator go to work, oftentimes in a fully discretionary format. And that's by, by when you know that you can trust the operator, over the long run, the deals are going to be better. I say the fifth and final thing here is scale. So when we first entered the commercial real estate crowdfunding space, you know, so to speak, in 2014, one of the reasons I would say why CrowdStreet went straight to institutional quality commercial real estate, in addition for all the reasons I cited, but also because we intended to become a major player in the commercial real estate capital markets. And the only way to achieve that level of success was to compete at the institutional level, given how much of this total market is comprised of this kind of real estate. And I'd say, so maybe some other platforms, they took an approach of starting small, thinking they could work their way up once they gained some traction. We saw some platforms have trouble transitioning that, you know, the transition proved harder than they thought. When I look back on our history, I think one of the things that maybe now I would say that we got right was by focusing on this level of institutional quality commercial real estate since day one, it is one of our key differentiators, you know, even today. There's a lot of things, but I think those are the main ones. I want to talk about how someone goes about deciding which deal to invest in on a platform like CrowdStreet, whether it is CrowdStreet or it's a different platform, any type of crowdfunding really when it comes to real estate. And I get asked this question a lot. So when someone's browsing through the various offerings, should they just always pick the one with the highest targeted IRR? Why or why not? I'm glad you asked this question because I think this probably touches on a, a particular little bit of a hot spot in my personal perspective. So the answer is absolutely not. I think for listeners, if there's one takeaway from today's podcast, it should be that selecting commercial real estate investments solely on the basis of targeted IRR is a recipe for disaster. So, so now with that said, let's kind of peel that back. So to begin to understand why, I think it's valuable to start by thinking about the concept of the risk reward spectrum. So imagine a graph, right? We've got an X axis and a Y axis. And let's go ahead and plot returns along the X axis and risk along the Y axis. So you go all the way down to no risk, start with a risk-free return, say that's about 2% today. 
And then we're going to trend, you know, we're going to have an upward sloping curve. It could be 40 degrees, 38 degrees, whatever it is. It's going to trend upwards to the right and it's going to continue on to add more risk for every level of return that you expect, right? And that's exactly what that curve is intended to convey. So for commercial real estate, well, we live within this paradigm. This is a curve that applies to us. And I'd say it's possible to shift this curve up or down, maybe, depending upon what you might know, what, what level of information, if you have imperfect information that you're leveraging to your advantage, now you're maybe getting a little bit better return for every level of risk. But at the end of the day, you cannot escape the idea that when you expect greater returns, you are accepting greater risk. It's just simply, that's how it works. So when we apply this graph to actually like real deals and we think about them on a leveraged basis, well, I would say that when we start about these, when we think about the least risky deals, say the deals that are going to be what we call core and are going to show up in our marketplace, well, targeted returns on those, on those types of properties are going to range somewhere between 7 and 9% on an annualized basis. That's the basic. That's, that's a core deal. You can feel pretty good. That's a, that's a deal you sleep at night. From there, we're going to start stepping out in terms of risk. Now, if we go all the way out to the end of the curve, way out there on the spectrum, we're going to have what we call the most riskiest opportunistic deals. Those can reach over 30% targeted on an annualized basis. But then what you are accepting is if you go for that deal, it has so many moving parts. It could be distressed. It could be vacant. It could be you got to tear down half of it and rebuild it. There's so much that takes on risk to get to that return that investors are accepting a very real possibility of principal loss. And you know, I think the unfortunate thing is that when some investors are newer on the marketplace or just newer in general, they, they, they tend to view risk as a relatively constant and they're thinking that higher returns on a targeted basis translate into higher actual returns. And that's where I just go back to, it just doesn't, doesn't work that way. It could work that way, but it might not, and you might end up you know, with, with a deal that turns into a loss because, well, you're swinging for the fence. You swing for the fence every time you, you got to expect a strikeout. Well, when I, and when I think about assembling a portfolio of different commercial real estate investments, this is why I have always advocated for a blended approach when it comes to risk and returns. It's definitely fine for investors to go for the allure of that 20 plus IRR deal, you know, particularly when the story of the deal is compelling and you're ready to take risk. But if you do, well, then possibly on the next deal, consider something a little less risky. Allocating to a deal, for example, that might be a stabilized multifamily asset. It's got conservative leverage on it. It's got cheap long-term fixed rate debt on it. That's a kind of deal that's going to target a returns in roughly maybe a 12 to 13% annualized range. But I can tell you that it has a much stronger probability of delivering those targeted returns than the deal that you just invested in at 22. It just, you know, and again, I go back to this is the kind of deal that you can sleep at night. So think about risk and return as a spectrum and just know where you're plotting yourself and what you're expecting in exchange to, to get that level of return. So we're talking about these returns using the IRR. For those who maybe not haven't heard that before, what is an IRR? It's a very good question. Uh, something we put on our website years ago to, to educate investors. So IRR stands for internal rate of return. And in layman's terms, that translates to, it's a series of cash flows that are translated into an annualized rate of return, but one that factors in the time value of money. And you can calculate it in Excel. And I'd say a simple example, I think really kind of best illustrates the difference between IRR and just a simple annualized rate of return, which we call average annualized return or AAR. Let's say, for example, right, we're going to do a deal. Now, we invest a dollar, and in this scenario, you earn 10% annual yield on your investment every year for five years. And, it, and at the end of that fifth year, you receive your money back. So in this scenario, you would have a 10% IRR, and that would translate to 1.5 multiple on your money. You invest a dollar, you got a total of $1.50 back over five years and 10 cents of return every year on your money to get there. So now let's modify that scenario. Say, for example, you're still going to earn a total of $1.50 over five years, but then now let's accelerate your annual yield into the first two years. So now you're going to earn a 25% yield in year one and year two. 25 cents in year one, 
25 cents in year two. You're going to receive no money back on the annualized basis. You get your principal back in year five. So we've earned the same amount of total money over the same amount of time, but we've accelerated when we get that annual yield. Well, now if you take that and dump that into Excel, you're going to see that the IRR on that investment is now 11.7%. So we jump from 10% to 11.7%. And despite the fact that you reserve the same total amount of money over five years, and to me, that, so this just exemplifies how the IRR takes into account the time value of money. And by accelerating the cash yield, you're going to bump the IRR. And so I really think the takeaway for investors in this example is that any time you are considering a targeted IRR of an investment. You must also consider the equity multiple or what is just really the total return of that investment and then look at that combination holistically. This is definitely how sophisticated institutional investors look at it. And I would say, and I know because I've negotiated with them over the years, they tend to value the total return or what we call the equity multiple over the IRR because they know that the IRR can be easily manipulated simply by altering the holding period. And groups that have money and are looking to grow wealth, well, they're looking for total return. And so I think what that translates to when you're, when you're looking at deals is you might look at a deal with a longer term hold. It might have a lower targeted IRR, but it might have a total higher return or equity multiple. And if you don't necessarily have a pressing need for the money to come back to you faster, well, in that case, you might be better off opting for the greater total return and letting that money stay out there a little bit longer. So those are the two things. Consider IRR and equity multiple, how they match together. There was an article I wrote a few years ago called The Yin and Yang of, of Equity Multiple and IRR. So this is, this is something that's really important, I think, as investors start to kind of get to the next level of understanding. For someone that's investing in commercial real estate, maybe not at the institutional level, maybe a, a level down, and maybe they're just doing it themselves personally, maybe buying small strip malls or buying larger multifamily, but not institutional. How important is that dynamic between the IRR and the equity multiple? Or is it really mainly important when you start to get to the institutional scale? I think it's important at both levels, Robert. So I, when you, again, I go back to beginning with the thought process of why am I investing? Am I investing to try to accelerate and earn a quick hit, take some, expose my money for a short term, take chips off the table and then reassess? Am I investing because as an individual, for example, I have a 12 year old daughter, am I trying to put her through college? Okay. The answer is yes. Do I need the money? If I'm going to invest today to put my daughter through college, knowing that she's going to show up in college, hopefully six years from now then that's my starting point. I probably don't need to really harvest that investment to pay for college for at least another year or two, knowing that I'm going to have some money already set aside to do that. I'm thinking through that scenario, that's a, that's a six to nine year type of hold. So really what I'm going to do is I'm going to then look for knowing that that's where you begin the analysis, then the execution of that analysis is finding the deal or combination of deals, combination of investments, doesn't have to just be deals that are going to get you to the goal. So I begin there. So whether, whether that means at the end of the day, like an IRR does give you, a, it's a valuable metric, right? Because it's going gonna, it's gonna to break down that series of cash flows into that time-weighted annualized rate of return. So I do know that all things being equal, if I can make a 20 IRR versus a 10 IRR, well, I know that in three years or five years or seven years, I'm probably going to make a lot more money doing the 20s than the 10s. But again, it's the manipulation of the time period because I could make more money in a 15 versus a 10. I could make more money in a 10 versus a 15 if I'm thinking about how long I'm holding the investment. And maybe the goal is, well, I need a certain dollar amount that I'm really trying to, the nest egg I'm trying to build. They go hand in hand. You have to look at them both. There's not one right way or wrong way to look at it. I just think that it's really important to think about total return while you're thinking about annualized return. Someone who's listening to the show that might be interested in investing in some commercial real estate through a crowdfunding platform like CrowdStreet, or whether they're just interested in investing in crowdfunded real estate deals through another platform, maybe they want to do smaller residential stuff. Do you always have to be an accredited investor? So the answer is that for the CrowdStreet marketplace, the answer is yes. 
while our minimum investment amount is $25,000, either for a single asset or one of our vehicles, you must meet the SEC's definition of an accredited investor. It's important to point out that this is the SEC's definition. It's not mine. It's not anything with the industry. We're living within this world. We just have to play by the rules. And what the definition of an accredited investor really means is that you have to satisfy one of two tests. There's an income test or there is a net worth test. Under the income test, the investor either earns at least $200,000 annually as an individual or $300,000 jointly. And the expectation is you're going to do that going forward. Under the net worth test, the investor has a total net worth of at least $1 million, and that is exclusive of the investor's personal residence. Now, there's a third test too. There's a standalone entity test. So if you have a trust, for example, a trust can also be an accredited investor. But in order for that trust to qualify, in order for any standalone entity to qualify as an accredited investor, it must have at least $5 million worth of assets. So what I would say is that, so yes, CrowdStreet, we are an accredited investor platform. There are other options out there. There's definitely a few reputable platforms that we know that offer investments for non-accredited investors. The offerings that you'll find on these platforms, well, they're typically offered pursuant to Regulation A. That's a, that's a form, that's, a, that's another change in legislation that came about in recent years. And you're going to find that on average, those offerings are structured either as a fund or as a real estate investment trust. And so it's certainly a viable option. You know, I would say that the, the one-off single asset deals, those are always typically going to be accredited, but there's other options out there for investors as well if you're not quite to that criteria. Some people might be thinking that listing their potential deals on crowdfunding platforms would be a great way to raise capital. Can anyone list deals on crowdfunding sites or do they have to be an accredited investor or do they have to go through some sort of process to get a deal listed there? Without being able to speak for other platforms, I'll, I'll walk you through kind of what it takes to, to come to the CrowdStreet marketplace. And so, you know, CrowdStreet as a company is highly selective uh, when we consider offerings for our marketplace. As we discussed earlier, roughly five out of every 100 potential deals is what actually makes it to the marketplace. Generally speaking, eligibility for sponsors for it to come to the marketplace, it really kind of begins at a minimum of about $100 million of total transaction experience under their belt. They typically possess a strong track record of performance and they have strong references. And however, with that said, I'd say these days, it is increasingly common for CrowdStreet Marketplace sponsors to have over $1 billion of total transaction experience, as well as to have a large team of dedicated professionals on staff to handle those items that I talked about earlier, such as investor reporting, asset management, and accounting. So it's a pretty exhaustive process. We're really looking, like I said, because we're a direct-to-investor platform, we are really looking for that kind of best-in-breed sponsor uh, with outstanding deal flow for our platform. There's different ways to fit within the ecosystem. And you know, this is just how it works at CrowdStreet. I think we've had a really great conversation about CrowdStreet and commercial real estate investing in general. Now I'm curious to get some more insight as to what your personal real estate investing looks like. What does your current portfolio look like? Are you investing in real estate individually yourself? Are you putting all of your money into crowdfunded deals? What does that look like? Before I joined CrowdStreet, I was, uh, I was a private real estate investor. I invested in deals through my previous private equity firm. I used to be a multifamily syndicator, so I owned multifamily. I still own a multifamily property. But since I've joined CrowdStreet, I, I guess I've, I've kind of um, I've eaten my dog food, so to speak. So I, I invest in deals on the marketplace. So far, I have invested in 12 deals. And of those 12, I have seen three of them realized. Fortunately for me, all three were above pro forma. So I, I do continue to invest regularly on the marketplace. And my cadence of investing depends greatly on my personal liquidity. I'm just an individual investor like everybody else out there. If you want to think about asset types of those 12 deals, I get asked that a lot. They consist of office, multifamily, medical office, and hospitality. And I would really say that right now, it should really include retail as well. Um, I'm a huge believer in the counter-cyclical play that is within the retail industry, uh, particularly when it's uh, associated with grocery-anchored retail. Uh, for example, I just missed out, I think, on a great opportunity to invest in a shopping center that was recently on our marketplace that was located in the greater Boston metro. I think if I was more focused on investing uh, last month than enjoying some time off at the end of the year, I, I think I would have probably jumped on that one. And I, I would say that part of my personal investment criteria 
it centers on what I perceive to be oftentimes a relatively attractive going in basis. I oftentimes look at things that at the end of the day, buying a property at a certain price per square foot, we're oftentimes adding money to it and then we're exiting it. And we're hopefully exiting that at a greater price per square foot. So to me, both numbers, the entry number, the exit number, and then I think third, the amount of money going into the deal need to make sense uh, for me to get on board with a deal. And I'd say that in of my three realized deals, that in particular two of the realized transactions, kind of this philosophy has served me well. And also, I strongly believe uh, that great deals have great stories. Anytime I'm looking to invest in a deal, I'm analyzing the story behind the deal. If that story is compelling, it makes sense, and it stands up to scrutiny, very important part, (laughs) then I want to dig in and understand that deal in in much more detail. And I think finally, oh, you know, just Other than CrowdStreet, like I said, I have an ownership stake in a 150-unit multifamily property that's located in Moore, Oklahoma. That goes back to my multifamily syndication days. I've owned that firm for a long time. And, you know, this is is just a direct holding that predates my tenure at CrowdStreet. It'll probably sell at one point in the future. I don't know. (laughs) But that's my personal real estate investing experience. So when you do have, like you mentioned, you're you're just an individual investor like everyone else that's listening to the show. So when you have liquid capital that you're ready to invest, what is the thought process you go through to determine whether you want it to go into an offering on CrowdStreet's platform or if you want to maybe deploy this as an individual active investor yourself? Or are you just not interested in that anymore because you would prefer the returns on a passive investment where you don't need to do anything through CrowdStreet? Today, I am a passive investor, but every marketplace investor is really a passive investor, right? I'm investing directly alongside other investors on the marketplace, right? My name is showing up in the ledger right next to another marketplace participant's name. I don't get special treatment. If anything, I'd say that sometimes I get less than special treatment because if there's an oversubscribed scenario, I'm going to probably bounce myself out to give investors a chance just so that I know that I'm kind of sticking honest to the whole thing and I'm not trying to cherry pick my own opportunities. But what I'm looking for is I'm looking for the same types of things that other investors are out there are looking for. You know, we're looking for opportunity. Uh, I'm given where I am in my my life cycle of investing. Like I said, I've got some young kids I want to put through college one day. You know, I have I have money to put to work that I don't necessarily need to have back uh, for income. I'm not, I'm in the very core middle part of my career, right? Still got 20 plus years to go, but I've been in business for 20 to 25. And so that means that I'm not afraid to take some risk, calculated risks, right? But like I talked about earlier in terms of risk and reward, so I might go for a value add type of strategy more often than not. I know that I'm taking serious risk when I do it. But I also know that if I make five good decisions and one bad one, that you know I can bounce back from that, and so some of the wins are going to moderate out some of the losses. And you know I'm looking to build wealth as I get older, as I go more towards retirement. Then yes, of course, my investment philosophy is going to change. I'm going to be starting to think more about current income and how to how to go through more wealth preservation. My thought process is no different than other investors' thought processes out there in terms of you know what are we really trying to achieve at the end of the day. Ian, as always, thanks so much for your time and joining me here on the Investors Podcast. Where can the audience go to connect with you? Yeah. As I always kind of mention on any interview, I love to connect with investors. I love to talk about deals. I'm a certainly a deal junkie. To find me, it's pretty easy. I am the only Ian Formigli on LinkedIn. So you simply pull that up. Find, you'll find me right away. Investors are also welcome to find me through CrowdStreet. You can hit up info at crowdstreet.com. We have a large team that can pick it up. They're going to take that inquiry and they're going to forward it to me. I can get back to investors. Please come check out our website, www.crowdstreet.com. As you do connect with me, ping me on LinkedIn or find me through info at CrowdStreet. Provide feedback. We constantly strive to improve the investor's experience on the platform. We want to know what investors think, what works on our platform and what doesn't work. I can say confidently that our platform is better today than it was a year ago. I know that it's going to be better a year from now than it is today. And the only way it gets better is through your feedback. So please let me know. Be sure to let Ian know what you think about this episode as well. Let him know your feedback on everything we talked about. If you have any questions, feel free to shoot those over his way as well. Ian, I'll be sure to put links to everything you just mentioned in the show notes so everyone listening can go connect with you. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it.
Thank you, Robert. It was a pleasure. Always enjoy these kinds of conversations and I, and I look forward to uh, future conversations. All right, guys. That's all I had for this week's episode of Real Estate Investing. I'll see you again next week. Thank you for listening to TIP. To access our show notes, courses, or forums, go to theinvestorspodcast.com. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any decisions, consult a professional. This show is copyrighted by the Investors Podcast Network. Written permissions must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting.